Can you hear me all right? Yes, great. So I know it's before lunch and I will try to capture your attention for this last one half hour session and then we can all have some food. So my name is Roxanne Kovacs. I'm a research assistant at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. And I'm able to be here today because the University of Kyoto generously decided to sponsor me, for which I'm very grateful. Thank you very much. So the work I'm going to present here today um, is based on data collected in the framework of a broader research project, which is funded by the Medical Research Council in the UK. And that project takes place in about 200 primary healthcare facilities in rural Senegal. And it deals with the determinants of health worker performance and the quality of healthcare more broadly. So I was able to carve out this piece of work that I'm presenting here today from this broader project. And this work is also part of my PhD thesis. So I was asked to specify which role I played in the research. So I was part of defining the initial research questions, as well as managing data collection activities, doing the field work, data analysis, and data management, and so on. So um, just to give you a bit of context on where this work is taking place. So it's in Senegal, which is a country in West Africa, as all of you probably will know. So um, care in these facilities is delivered primarily by nurses, midwives, and unskilled providers. So there are very few doctors working in these areas. Moreover, most of the people who live in these southern areas of Senegal um, are in the DHS's lowest wealth quintile, generally live of subsistence agriculture, and care seeking generally is quite infrequent. So that serves as a bit of um, a context. So as I've already mentioned, today we're going to be talking about what patients can do to get their healthcare providers to deliver better healthcare. So why is this a question that we should be interested in? So in low and middle income countries, the quality of healthcare that is being provided is worryingly low. So several studies show that health providers frequently prescribe non-indicated, so incorrect treatments to patients. Moreover, several studies have demonstrated that healthcare providers invest relatively low levels of effort into consultations, meaning that they don't ask enough questions, they don't perform enough examinations, and so on. So the problem of poor quality care is um, accepted by the literature as well as policymakers alike. And a large number of different interventions really have been tried to tackle this problem of low quality care. So I would say that early interventions primarily focused on healthcare facilities and tried to eliminate, eliminate shortages in essential drugs and essential equipments. Recently, I think we can see a move towards individual healthcare providers, so nurses, doctors, midwives that are actually providing care in these facilities. So there are a broad range of interventions. For example, some of them um, have tried to tackle health providers' low levels of clinical knowledge by, for example, providing guidelines or training. Um, some have focused more on the organizational working environment and have provided, for example, supervision. And recently, there has been a lot of interest in interventions that try to tackle health providers' low level of motivation, um, primarily through financial incentives, so through performance-based financing schemes, which have been really spreading all across um, low-income countries recently. So if we were to review this massive literature in a couple of seconds, what you would see is that none of these interventions have really led to large improvements in the quality of healthcare in low-income countries. So you see very much of a mixed bag of some interventions working in some contexts and not in others, or leading to small changes or leading to no changes at all. So this somewhat begs the question if there is anything else we could do to improve the quality of healthcare in low-income countries. Perhaps something that doesn't focus on health facilities or healthcare providers. So in this paper, we explore the idea that involving patients in medical consultations could be one way to improve the quality of healthcare that they receive. So in high-income countries, there really has been a move towards the perspective that patients should have a more active role in medical consultations. Several interventions have been tried to help patients become more active. And the main goal of these interventions, I would say, is to, incre to increase patient satisfaction, as well as patients' ownership of their care to an extent. So in this paper, we take a slightly different approach and look at whether or not patient involvement could be a way to improve the actual quality of healthcare that is being delivered. And more specifically, we test whether patients who provide more information at the start of a medical consultation, of a medical consultation receive higher quality healthcare which we measure primarily in terms of the quality of treatments being prescribed. Good, so let's have a quick overview of methods, which is somewhat important for this um, project. So we make use of a technique called standardized patients. Standardized patients, the abbreviation is SPs, and I'm going to be using this throughout um, the presentation. So standardized patients are people who are healthy and who have been trained by researchers to consistently portray the specific symptoms of a medical case and visit health providers undercover. So standardized patients are Unhealth, they're healthy people who are pretending to be ill, 
Yeah? So, healthcare, so SPs visit healthcare providers, like normal patients, and afterwards they fill out a checklist, which provides information on pretty much everything that happened during the consultation. So the questions asked, physical examinations performed, recommendations made, how long the consultation took, as well as information on which drugs they got. So when it comes to evaluating the quality of healthcare, standardized patients are generally considered as the gold standard. Um, this is primarily for two reasons. So um, standardized patients generally have better recall than normal patients, so they remember better than normal patients what happened during the consultation. That's primarily because they were specifically trained to do so over several weeks usually. And moreover, with standardized patients, you don't have any observation bias because providers don't know that they're being observed because they think that standardized patients are real patients. So that makes standardized patients better than, for example, direct clinical observations or techniques like that. So um, in this study, in collaboration with healthcare providers from Senegal and the UK, we developed a textbook, very simple, straightforward case of a patient with symptoms of pulmonary tuberculosis. And we trained healthy people for two weeks so that they are able to convincingly pretend that they are people with symptoms of TB, tuberculosis. So um, TB is a serious infection of the lungs and it has highly characteristic symptoms, most importantly of which a persistent cough, so a cough that doesn't stop for several weeks. And this can be associated with a number of things, including unintentional weight loss, coughing up blood, fatigue, fever, night sweats, and chills. So um, in this study, we rely on a randomized field experiment and we um, randomly vary the amount of information that our fake patients provide at the start of the medical consultation. So, um, and then we assess how this impacts treatment quality. So RSPs are randomized to present one of two introductory statements. The generic statement, which is used in the control group, and the detailed statement, which is used in the treatment group. So when SPs are asked by their health providers, why have you come here today? SPs in the control group say, I have been coughing for two weeks now and I don't feel good. SPs in the treatment group, on the other hand, say, I've been coughing for two weeks, sometimes when I cough I see traces of blood, and I have lost weight. So what you can see here is that for patients in the control group, they give one characteristic symptom of tuberculosis, which is the persistent cough. On the other hand, patients in the treatment group provide three characteristic symptoms. So coughing, coughing up blood, and unintentional weight loss. And so we randomized all the health providers who took part in our study to receive either the standardized patient with the generic or the detailed statement, so either the treatment or the control group. And in order to not confound standardized patient effects with treatment effects, we randomized this at the health provider level. So let's just have a quick look at a flowchart of how this would work in an actual consultation. So the RFIC patient comes to the, to the facility, the provider asks them, why have you come? Patients in the treatment group provide the detailed statement, patients in the control group provide the generic statement. Afterwards, however, the cases are presented in the, in the in an identical manner. So when providers ask questions, SPs give the same answers. When they perform physical exams, they find the same thing. So really, these cases are identical in terms of medical history and everything else. The only thing that differs is the introductory statement. Good. So, just to give you a quick idea of which kind of sample sizes we're talking about. So our standardized patients visited 196 primary healthcare providers in 196 primary health facilities in Senegal. We have some basic information on the health facilities, we know about structural quality, facility type, and so on. Due to the way we collected the data, we have further information on 134 of these health providers. So we really know quite a lot about them. They completed the lengthy questionnaire. We know about their training, their education, their background. And um, we also know about their level of motivation, which is measured in terms of their intention to quit their current job. We'll get back to that. And we also know about their knowledge of handling patients with tuberculosis. Um, moreover, given that, if you remember, the SP methodology relies on the assumption that providers think that standardized patients are normal patients, we phoned all healthcare providers after they were visited by our fake patients to ask them if they had any suspicion that someone they saw wasn't actually a real patient. So I will spare you the descriptive statistics, but overall our results indicate that the health providers in the treatment and the control group don't differ in terms of specific, in terms of important characteristics. Moreover, we find that under 3% of our health providers, which is 16 in total, had suspicions about RSPs being normal patients or not, which is quite common. It's quite low, actually, in comparison to other um, standardized patient studies. So to give you an idea of how the analysis is organized. So we're interested in three different questions. First of all, can patients affect the quality of treatments they receive through their introductory statement? Secondly, what are the pathways through which um, information affects outcomes, and lastly, can we observe any heterogeneity, so any differences among healthcare providers? Good. So let's have a, a look at our first question, which is whether patients can affect the quality of treatments they receive through their opening statement. So um, 
We can answer this question due to our nice randomized design by comparing patients in the treatment and the control group. Um, so looking at this bar chart here, it appears to be that yes, patients are able to influence the quality of treatments they receive through their introductory statement. Due to the randomization, we know that the only difference between these two cases really is this one sentence of the opening phrase. And to substantiate these um, findings here, we also run some probit regressions, where we regress the probability of providing a correct treatment on several characteristics, including um, the opening statement used. And we find here, thankfully, that <laughs> these results are consistent with the bar chart I showed you earlier, meaning that patients in the treatment group are 17% more likely to receive a correct treatment than patients in the control group. And this also holds, if you look at the third um, model here, this also holds when patients for which providers had a suspicion that they might not be real patients are excluded. In fact, then the effect increases to a 20% increase in the quality of treatments being provided. So what are the pathways through which these through which information affects outcomes. So why are we seeing these um, effects? So one might think that in case patients um, provide little information to healthcare providers, healthcare providers simply spend a bit more time, ask some more questions, and just in general invest a bit more effort into the consultation. So we are, given that we have data on all of this, we are able to test empirically whether healthcare providers in the control group who have less information actually do seem to invest more effort. So in these models here, you can see that um, the dependent variable is the proportion of questions asked and examinations performed in the consultation, as well as the duration of the consultation. What we see here is quite interesting because it shows you that healthcare providers in the control group who have less information don't ask more questions, don't perform more examinations, and do not spend more time with patients. So it appears that there is no catch-up effect in which providers who have less information make up for it by investing more effort. Um, this bar chart here also um, goes into the same line of thought. And what you can see here is that the blue chart, uh, the blue bar refers to the quality of treatments provided by providers in the treatment group. And the three red bars show you treatment quality for providers in the control group. So um, the dark red bar refers to treatment quality provided by health workers in the treatment group who did not ask for any of the information that was volunteered by patients in the treatment group you know, the ones who said more. And the other two red bars show you treatment quality for health providers in the control group who asked for either one or both of the pieces of information that were provided in a way for free by patients in the treatment group. And in a way, what this is showing is that for the health providers in the control group who did not ask for any of the information that was provided for free in the treatment group performed significantly worse than those in the control group. So these are 60% of providers. So basically this is just reiterating the idea that information or not asking for information that is given for free otherwise is really what is at work here. So our last question is um, whether or not there is heterogeneity um, across healthcare providers and we look at heterogeneity in terms of providers' level of motivation. So we measure motivation in terms of health providers' intention to quit their current job. And we could perform this analysis for a subsample for whom we had this um, information. So basically what this interaction term is showing you here is that for demotivated providers, so for those who want to quit their current job, this treatment effect is much stronger than for motivated providers who do not want to quit their current job. So one might think that this is because if you're, if you're demotivated, you're even less likely to invest more effort when someone comes and they don't provide very much information. So it seems it seems like these providers are even less likely to want to catch up by investing more effort. Some brief evidence on robustness. I think given that it's pre-lunch, I'm going to keep this rather short. So our um, results are um, robust to a number of alternative specifications. Some of them are shown here. So they hold when we include um, provider, a further broader set of provider characteristics, as well as um, a measure of health provider knowledge. And this holds for excluding these detected standardized patients as well. So, Let's think about what all of this um, means. So um, we find that patients who provide more information at the start of their consultation are 17% more likely um, to receive correct treatments than those who wait for their health provider to ask for this information. Um, results seem to indicate that the reason why um, information has an impact is that um, prov um, because Providers don't ask for the missing information that was provided by treatment, patients in the control group. And um, we also find that patients in the, in the control, providers in the control group sorry, who provide less information also do not make up for these differences in information by asking more questions or performing more exams. Overall, for us, this seems to point a picture of relatively low levels of provider motivation, which are not uncommon in rural areas because of generally low levels of salaries, different working conditions, and... Um, and um, 
few opportunities for professional development. So one question we might want to consider is whether this effect size of 17% increase in treatment quality is large or small. Of course, here it's difficult to find a suitable study that offers a comparison, but one study conducted by Gertler and Bassinger in um, Rwanda um, provides um, a good example. I would assume that many of you are familiar with this study because it's frequently it's used as a success story for performance-based financial incentives in low-income countries and is often used as a justification for implementing performance-based financing scheme in other, schemes in other places. So um, one of their key findings um, is that this performance-based financing scheme, which provides financial bonuses to health providers, um, leads to a relatively small increase in the quality in the process quality of care being provided. They find that health providers who receive these bonuses ask 6% more questions and perform 6% more examinations. And of course, keep in mind that the number of questions asked and examinations done is not necessarily very strongly related to the quality of treatments that you actually get. So it seems like it's actually pretty difficult to increase treatment quality and that even for other, term, for other um, famous and successful interventions, the absolute increase in treatment quality isn't actually very large, which might be taken as evidence to suggest that the treatments effects we find here are actually um, quite substantial. So let's have a think um, about policy relevance. So our result suggests that patients receive better care when they provide their healthcare provider with more um, information at the start of the consultation. So does this mean that we should encourage patients to simply tell their healthcare provider about all the symptoms they have at the start of the consultation? Well, not necessarily. Because medical knowledge is a complex thing and patients don't necessarily know which pieces of information are relevant and which pieces aren't. So patients really first would need to be educated about which symptoms are relevant and which, which ones aren't. So even in low-income countries, public awareness campaigns that try to educate the public are by no means uncommon. For example, in terms of tuberculosis, patients are frequently educated about the symptoms of TB as well as the costs of seeking care. But what our results seem to be suggesting is that public awareness campaigns might want to go one step further. Instead of only encouraging patients to seek care when they have specific symptoms, they might also want to encourage patients to tell their provider that they are having these symptoms. Naturally, we're not suggesting that this should be done for all conditions, given that there are just simply too many. But policymakers might want to consider implementing an intervention like this for symptoms, uh, for conditions with very clear disease pictures, like for example tuberculosis and of course those with um, public health relevance. So in a way to really put our findings to the test, um, further studies would need to implement such a public awareness campaign and see how it, um, this impacts treatment quality or not. I think I will stop it here like that we have some time for questions and then we can go for lunch. Thank you very much. <laughs>